Everybody had a great day? Y'all got to help me encourage everybody to come to church on Wednesday. Wednesday is a very important part. You can't do everything on Sunday in 30 minutes. And you need teaching. You need a good Bible study. And that's what we try to reserve Wednesdays for is just teaching things. I want to talk about tonight about maintaining our focus in a world that's out of focus. We need to be praying for the re Ukraine and those precious people over there. There's a lot of talk of nuclear war and gas is almost $5 a gallon. And uh, I think the church can do something about it. We'll pray and talk to God about it. You know, in the Bible, there would be famines and there would be times when the people in the land would go through hard times, but God's people would always fare well because he took care of them, and that's where I want to be. I want to be where he takes care of us. I want to read tonight from... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and you can remain seated. I'm on verse 14 through 23. You know, it's, it's getting saved is not all that difficult. It's staying saved over the long haul. A lot of things happen, betrayal, church hurt. Uh, you just get kind of, if you're not careful, you can get bored with church, you know, and say, ah, why, let's, let's just stay home tonight, you know. They're going to sing three songs and take up an offering, and we've done heard those songs a thousand times, and, you know, pastor's probably going to teach something out of the scripture or whatever, you know. But when we start thinking like that, it's dangerous. Because we've got to stay in the, we got to run the race with patience and and finish this race that we've started. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with 14, he says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. He says, verse 16, rejoice evermore. He says, to pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He says, verse 19, to quench not the spirit. He says, despise not prophesyings. Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Watch this one, verse 22. He says, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of y'all believe that he's probably coming now sooner than ever? Uh, I don't know, if I was a non-church goer, I probably would start thinking about, you know what, I think we might ought to get in church and get our junk together. You know, with all the world events that's going on, uh, it and the, the hatred that we see now and division in our world and our government everywhere, and it, and it, it just blows my mind that Russia decided they would just start destroying the Ukraine. Uh, they may not win the war over there, but there's going to be nothing left but rubble. I couldn't imagine. Could you imagine your life coming to a halt? You don't go to work anymore. There is no work. The place where you work got blew up. Could you imagine that? The grocery store is closed now. There's nowhere to get gasoline if you're alive. Because they were people just be walking down the street and they would just randomly kill them, rape the women, the young girls, and 
you know, you know, just atrocities that's beyond the, it's beyond my imagination, the evil that's, that's going on over there. And this isn't the first time this type of stuff's happened. Okay, it's happened before in the World War I, World War II, and all of those, and even wars way beyond those. It seems like man's always been fighting about something. You'd think that Russia would just find, go plant a garden or something. You know, I don't know. Go find something to do besides kill your neighbor. Doesn't make much sense, does it? But everything in this world seems to work against us trying to be a Christian. Our jobs, it's hard to find a job now. Brother Freeze, he's just now getting off work. It's like they've done everything that they can to keep him from being in church on Wednesday. Uh, Hannah's been sick literally as a dog. She's been in the hospital now for about three days. She came home today uh, doing much better, but still uh, sick, weak. She's lost about 20, 30 pounds, and uh, she's just had a time of it. And Asher's sick tonight. He's got a bad earache. His mama had to stay home with him. He's running a fever, not feeling well. He had to go to the doctor today. It just seems like a lot of things cause it to be very difficult to stay focused on living right and serving God and, and keeping what I like to say the main thing, the main thing in our lives. You know, it's hard to maintain a relationship with God in our society the way it's so sin-driven. And I don't know, television nowadays, they blend in profanity with the name of Jesus. And have you noticed that? The religion and, and cursing and drinking and all, they're blending it all together now. And now we're seeing the devil perverting what God has created, a human being. They're telling children now in elementary school that, hey, if you want to be a girl, you can be a girl, or if you want to be a boy, you know, you can be a boy, whatever, you know, and, and this perverted mess. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was a cakewalk when you start comparing it to our world and, and abortion and things like that. I do realize there are times when things go wrong and for the life of the mother, they have to do what they have to do. But uh, to just say, you know what, I don't want this kid, you know, it's bad timing, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm just going to kill it or have it killed doesn't make any sense to me at all. But that's where we're at. And everything seems to be anti-God nowadays. I don't know about you all, but it, it, it really does. The devil's doing everything he can to try to defile what God started in the beginning. And Romans prophesied that this would happen, that women would turn to women and men would turn to men and they would do those things unseemly. And, uh, and because of that, they didn't retain God in their knowledge, it said, is how they fell into that. You know, and here, here's the argument you get when you try to witness to people. Well, you believe your Bible and I'll believe my way. You know, it, it, we were living in a time when everybody picked their Bible up and believed what it said. And nowadays, we've got people that don't even, they discount it all together. You know, if, if you want to read your Bible and be a Christian, keep it over there. But we don't, we don't read the Bible. We don't, we think differently. And so it makes it difficult in the workplace to try to live right. You know, uh, Seth was telling me here a while back, doesn't want to know why he didn't curse. You know, and he, why should I? You know, why should I be adding words in that doesn't make any sense to start with? And it kind of blew their mind because, but they're in your face with it. Um, I've won couples before and tried to disciple them and work with them, and they would be like in your face with their sins and their things that they wanted to do. And, you know, I didn't care. It, you know, it wasn't offending me, but, but you were trying to educate them, you know, to do these things God doesn't appreciate. And so you try to teach people and disciple people what pleases God and what doesn't please God. And really we try to help as a pastor or a minister or a teacher, help you not have to study quite as much because we can break the word down for you and teach you things a lot quicker than you can study it. 
But you know, Jesus had a lot to say about concerning this world and about how difficult it was to get out of here. You know, he said there would be many, many that would come unto him and say, Lord, Lord, in those last days at the judgment. And he would say, I didn't know you. Even the, the ten virgins, when you read that parable, they were all virgins. They all had lamps. They all had oil in their lamps. They just didn't have the same amount of oil. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. And it got down to the end. And while the five were going and hunting oil, the other five went into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the door was shut, the Bible says. And they came back trying to get in, and the Lord said, Hey, I didn't even I don't know y'all. And so we know that there's a straight and a narrow way we've got to follow to get out of here, to stay saved. When you look at the scriptures, the New Testament, it dedicates four of the first four books to just biography the life and times of Jesus Christ and the teachings that he did, his death, burial, and resurrection. And then we have the actual Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts. This is where they actually documented or recorded the historical account of people actually getting saved. But then the 21 books after that is all written about how to stay saved. So the Lord knew that he only needed one book to tell us how to get out of here, but he needed 21 letters to teach us how to stay on the right track and how to act right. Because I'm going to be honest with you. Um, he said the first and greatest commandment was what? Was to love him, right? With all your mind, heart, soul, everything. And then the second one didn't deal with drinking alcohol it didn't deal with adultery. It didn't deal with um, envy and strife and hatred. It dealt with how you treated your neighbor. He said, you've got to love your neighbor like you love yourself. And that's where the church has its downfall, or Christians have their downfall, is dealing with hatred and betrayal and vices and things like that in our lives. If you ever let the seed of bitterness gets started in you. It is hard to get it out. There are so many people that sit home on Sunday morning because they've been to a church and they got hurt. That's one of the biggest things going today is called church hurt. It's where they've been somewhere and they got betrayed by someone Maybe they disclosed some private information that they were dealing with, and then that person went and told it, and it got out and it embarrassed them, and they felt betrayed, and these things. You might as well get used to it. The Lord told us that we'd be hated for his name's sake. He said, you're going to catch a lot of flack if you walk with me. They just uh, That's just the way it is. They hated me. Matter of fact, they traded out a prisoner to take me into custody and crucify me. So we know that the way is going to be sometimes difficult. There's an old saying, if you live for God hard, it's easy. But if you live for him easy, it's hard. It can get to be difficult. And so we've got to keep our focus at all times. Even when we're on the job, and let's say there's some, I don't know about you all, but every job I've ever worked, there's always at least one that's a thorn in your flesh won't do their job running back to the boss man and telling stuff or sowing discord among the other people on the job, you know, trying to say you're not doing your part of the job and it's causing problems in fact. And after a while, you develop a bitterness toward this individual. And this is where we as Christians have to guard that part of our heart. At all costs, we have to guard this thing because if we ever let hatred and bitterness get set up inside of us, it's, it's like a canker worm. It will just eat you alive slowly but surely from the inside out. I've had to deal with it. Probably all of you had to deal with it on some level. Uh, it doesn't make any sense why people betray one another, but they do. You know, we had one of the disciples sit right there and betray the, our Lord and Savior, you know, all over a, a little bit of money. And uh, so it's going to happen. So, Bo, so if it's going to happen, how do we deal with it? 
Well, first and foremost, if we establish biblical principles in our lives, a lot of people are not people of principle. Uh, the old people just a hundred years ago were people of principle. If they gave you their word on something, you could guarantee that. If they borrowed something and said, tomorrow I'll have it back by 5 o'clock, it'd be back by 5 o'clock, and if they broke it, they bought you another one. That's just the way people rolled in those days. Nowadays, people borrow stuff, and you got to go hunt it down when you need it. You know, or that, you know what I'm saying? Just uh, the integrity of people nowadays is just not the same. Their principles are not there. I believe in the households, the principles are not being taught by the father because the dad has such an influence over his children and the things that he does. And so you establish principles into your children that they live by. And one of those principles is this. We're not going to intentionally this week decide we're just not going to put no gas in our car, right? I don't think there's nobody here going to do that, you know, and find yourself on the side of the road. So we've got to make sure that we don't intentionally miss church. We've got to make sure we don't intentionally keep God number one in our lives. Remember, the Bible says that God's a jealous God. Okay? And when anything we esteem higher than him, a kid, a grandchild, I've seen families before that had to quit coming to church because they had a two-year-old or a three-year-old kid that they couldn't do nothing with it. And so it was, and I understand that. I understand trying to sit still in church and trying to keep that young and still, and they'll always show out when they're in a group of people. You know what I mean? They'll get you in Walmart or in, or in a funeral. Oh, Lord. Haley got me in a funeral one time when she was about two or three years old and started in wanting to, she called it e o n when she wanted to write. Okay, she still couldn't talk plain, so I gave her a pencil. And, of course, we're in a church where you could hear a pin drop, okay, in this funeral. My wife's uncle had passed away, and she's going <laughs> on this piece of paper. And I'm like, Haley, quieten it down, you know, quit it. And, of course, she's, uh, you know, right in the middle of all of that. So after about four or five of those, uh, and, of course, I'm down deep, about 20 people deep in a long pew. And I'm embarrassed. I'm red as a beet. And I said, you know what? We're going to the car. And when we get there, it's going to be a day you'll never forget. And when I got her little hiney to the car, her diaper come off, and I blistered her little rear end. And she never, ever again did that. All I had to do was look at her in church or if I was speaking or preaching was just make eye contact with her and she would sit up straight and pay attention because she knew that that just wasn't tolerated. And so that's principles that we have to teach not only ourselves but our kids that we've got heaven to gain, okay? And at all costs, we don't want to gamble with that. We're not going to gamble with our gasoline in our car, right? We're going to make sure we've got plenty of gas to get to work. Well, you know, I know some people that gamble, but, you know, most people, I think Danny's sister used to run out of gas all the time. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you all, but first and foremost, I, when I get up in the morning, I want to make sure that I'm right with Jesus, okay? And, I, and throughout the day, I want to double check, you know, and, when, and, and, and I realize things come up sometimes, okay? So I'm not preaching to the choir here, okay? But when the church doors is open, the principle is we come to church. Unless we are got something that's contagious or something, we probably need to stay home. But otherwise, we need to get dressed and we need to come and present ourselves to the Lord. Um, Christianity's gotten turned around a whole lot because nowadays people come to be entertained. And you'll see them a lot of times on social networking. Oh, the choir sang so pretty this morning. Or the preacher said the prettiest prayer, you know. And while we sat there like a dunce and listened to it, you know. And left the same way we did when we, we came. 
You know, man, I ain't in it for that. You know, I want to leave changed. I want to leave edified. You know what I'm saying? I want to learn something new. I want to tap into what God has to offer. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he, he, he's afforded the church the nine spiritual gifts. Uh, he says anything we ask in his name, he'll do it if we believe it. You know, why not, why not use those resources? He said, if you'll seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, he said, I'll add all the other things you're trying to work for. It's amazing how God works. If you'll just put him first. I understand we can't quit our jobs and sit home and put on a monk's robe and go out in a 40-acre field and, and chant prayers all day long, okay? That ain't getting you nowhere either, okay? Uh, we come to church to worship him, lift him up, to entertain his presence is why we come to church. And then he talks to us and he, he edifies us. He tells us rights and wrongs. He gives us words of edification sometimes. He gives us words that gets us stirred up, gets us excited. Then other times he chastises us. He says, you know, if you do, if father loves his son, he'll chastise him. And, he's, and sometimes he gets on to us, you know, you know, you've been robbing from me, you know what I mean? You hadn't been paying your tithes. You hadn't been coming to church like you should. You know, you've been using lame excuses to not be there. The people in Ukraine would love to be able to go to church right now and can't. Their churches have been blown up. So many of them have. I would, oh my God, I would hate to think that we lost our church and we had nowhere to go on Sunday, nowhere to collectively come together and worship the Lord. It's about us coming together corporately and worshiping him. And then he equips us so on Monday we can go out into this wicked world. You know what I'm talking about, Kim, where they backbiting and talking about one another and tearing one another down. You know, that's, that's a, a thing that people have learned to use. If you tear your neighbor down, then you don't look as bad. And it's a bad problem to get started. And a lot of families do that now. A lot of my family does it. They'll sit around the kitchen table and railroad on everybody else around, and it makes everybody there feel better about themselves. But the Lord said, uh-uh. He said, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Stop all of that, okay? Fix what's in you. Fix what needs to be fixed in you. And let them worry about getting themselves fixed. You know, oftentimes you hear people say there's a bunch of hypocrites in a church. Well, guess what? All of us are sitting here slipping on some level probably. If you hadn't slipped, get ready. You know, you probably will. So when you do, don't, don't throw in the towel. You know what I mean? That's why he put that in there in 1 John 1 and 9, that he's faithful and just to forgive us if we sin, if we'll confess it to him. So that's an, one of my principles is I've got to keep him number one in my life. And I've got to make sure when I lay my head down on my pillow every night that I'm right with him. You know, I know we sing, say those children's prayers, now I lay me down to sleep. You know what I mean? If you should come, take me, please, basically is what that prayer says. And I pray that type. Do you pray that prayer at night? I mean, I'm serious. Or do you just go to bed? It's easy just to go to bed and forget about it. Man, I got work tomorrow. I got problems down there. I got bills to pay, you know. Uh, I don't know about you all, but the washing machine went south two days ago. I got to deal with that now. You know how it always happens. They, the washing machine will go south right when you need it the most or when you really don't have the money to buy another one. And if you hadn't checked lately, washing machines are like three times what they were. You could get a pretty good machine for about 300 bucks. Not now. It's $1,000 now to get one, if you can even get one. I've heard reports of people having to order stuff like that, it being a year out because of inflation. And, our, our man, the United States is in a mess right now. 
I, I don't know where the, the government's mind's at when the gas pump's $4 and something a gallon, diesel fuel's almost $6 in some place, is $6, and you're thinking it ain't going to affect how everybody lives? It ain't going to affect our jobs and, and all of these things? I mean, it's even affecting people coming to church because now that $20 tank of gas that was getting you through the week now is 40 or 50 it's crazy how much it is, and if you were out, and if you went out here and bought one of these gas guzzlers a year or so ago, man, you in trouble. Fortunately, we didn't. We bought one that got good gas mileage, and that has saved us. It really has. If you got one of them little four-cylinder cars, boy, and just ease around in that thing, and 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 save a lot of money. But you know, I have to be guarded at all times because I'll lose my focus in life. I've been serving the Lord now going on 32 years. That's a long time, okay? And along the way, you can get tripped up. You can, you can go grow sour. You know what I mean? Uh, you, get, you can grow tired of dealing with people. All right? I'm just being honest here, okay? Because you'll see people, if you stay in church long, Brother Charles and them has been back here 20 years, and they've seen a lot of people cycle in and cycle out, okay? And they always drag people with them when they go. And they always call people and, and start talking and tell, you know, and, and I've always tried to teach you, if someone calls you up on the phone and starts railroading your pastor, and first of all, my Bible says to touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. When you put your lips on the man of God, you be careful. Let me get over here. You know, the ministry, that's who feeds you, okay? And you want that to maintain integrity at all costs. That's one of the reasons we have pre-service prayer at 930. That's so we come together and we pray. Why? I want God to speak to me. Right? I don't want to be gullible and think he's just going to roll it out here on a red carpet for me. I come and I get out on my knees and I seek him wholeheartedly. We have, that's why we've had prayer for the 27 years we've been here. At 930, we have prayer. That's a principle. We've got to get dressed. We've got to get to church. we got prayer at 930. I don't want to miss prayer. Why? Because the preacher can lie to me. The Sunday school teacher back there can mislead my children. Okay, they could have some other motive back there they're teaching, you know, that we don't know about. That's why the pastor, well, I have to keep an eye on things like that sometimes, you know. You just shove anybody in a Sunday school room with your kids and don't really vet them a little bit, you know. Um, I, I had one guy back there one time teaching Sunday school, and he was trying to say that when, when the serpent beguiled Eve in the Garden of Eden, they actually had... Um, an affair is the words I'll use, okay, since we got mixed here. And I'm like, no, 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 that ain't what happened, okay. He outsmarted her is what he did. And Eve's problem was she didn't know the word, okay. And Adam was standing there too, and he didn't know enough of the word either of what God had said, okay. And there's where we get in trouble again is my second principle is I need to hide that word away in my heart that I might not sin against him. In other words, how, you don't know what sin is until it's been revealed through the word. Even the Bible tells us that. So through the word of God, we learn what is sin and what's not sin. Okay, what is unpleasing to God and what's, Really, he hates for us to hate on our brother more than he does for us to go out here and get smashed, drunk, okay? Think about it for a minute now. He, he deals with them two things right there of how you love him and how we treat one another. And so we've got to be so cautious that over the years of people bite, backbiting, and there's, there's always going, anytime you've got a group of people together, there's going to be one or two in the group that's going to be gossiping, there's going to be toting tales, and going to be going, oh, did you hear what it was, you know, and then they embellish it, you know what I mean, and blow it all out of proportion, and, 
And, and, and sometimes you have to just let stuff like that roll off your back. Why? We're talking about getting to heaven, right? And only me is going to be standing at the judgment from me. So I got to make sure I get there, right? So I've got to, every day, I've got to pray intentionally. I've got to live for God intentionally, okay? Now, I know, realize you guys can't run out here and do this today, but I made a principle a long time ago that I would do my best not to take a job that would keep me out of church. And I was successful. Uh, a lot of times it, it takes a little while for God to work that out, okay? Um, sometimes you got to do what you got to do, all right? Uh, I mean, you, you can't let the house go back and start living in a tent, all right? You got to use good sense with these things. And God leads us and guides us. And we have a mission field on our job, you know? So, and I've got to remember that, that not only do I go to work now, and not only am I being a, a Christian now, but my Christian duty is to disciple others and tell them how to be a Christian. And my best way to do it is do it in front of them the life I live, right? So that's my, one of my principles again. I keep God number one. I make sure I'm right with my neighbor. I guard my heart at all times. And when someone tells a lie on me or something like that, I just let that roll on my back. And I, the Bible says, pray for them that despitefully use you. That's why the Lord used the example that if someone slapped you, you turned and gave them the other cheek. It takes a greater man or woman to turn the cheek than it does to fight, to control yourself, to control your anger, to control the things that, because see, unforgiveness defiles us. Y'all with me? So when someone, the devil, see, the devil's clever. He'll send somebody along that's carnal-minded and they'll offend you, okay? And then you get unforgiveness in your heart, okay? And when you get that lodged in there, it's hard to get it out. I don't know about you all, but the way I was back in the world, if you did me wrong, I was done with you. I'd just write you off. I don't never talk to you again, you know? Well, I got in church and tried that and it didn't work. God said, I don't work that way. He said, you've got to unload all of that bitterness and sin and, and unforgiveness because it'll eat you alive. And I have found when you give it all over to God and, and unload that thing at the altar, then it, it lightens that load. That burden you've been carrying around, you're toting it around for no reason. You, and, and it ain't hurting nobody but you. It's dragging you down. So there's my other principle. I guard my heart. I've got his word hid away in it so I know what's going on. You know, the, the word of God tells us how to deal with someone in the church that's unruly. It says you first go to that person privately. Then it says if they won't listen, you take another and you go to that person privately and you try to handle the matter. And then if it doesn't work, you bring it before the whole church. He gives us the order for handling disagreements and things like that. And he basically says we ought not to ever go to the law and sue. Through the law, we ought to handle our stuff in the church. He's given us the ways and the means to do that. He tells us in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25 and 26, he talks about saving and losing this life. Everybody wants to have the best of both worlds. And I would guess that most people come to church to avoid burning. Okay? That's a good uh, incentive to come, you know what I mean? That I don't want to burn forever, okay? But really, I should come to church to serve my master, my creator, the one who made me, the one who breathed life into me, the one that gave me the opportunity to live and breathe and love and feel all these emotions and these things and have an opportunity to go to a heavenly reward 
But he tells us in Matthew 16, verse 25 and 26, he says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So he basically tells us we've got to change where our values are at. You know, it's not about buying cars and building houses and doing all this stuff here because we leave it all behind. It's about investing in the next life. He says if we invest in the people into the next life, we'll have that life waiting on us. But if we spend our whole life here building our little kingdom, then we're going to lose the life to come. Now, I didn't say that. The Scripture did. So that's why it's so important that we keep Christ Jesus number one in our lives. And when the church doors is open, we come to church. And I know we've come from, from backgrounds a lot of the churches come over from England and they were real rigid and they had gotten away from worship. And uh, I heard someone in a church here the other day told them they had clapped their hands or something. And uh, they said they didn't have that type stuff there. We don't do that. And But the Bible says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout with the voice of triumph. That's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us how God likes for us to love on him. He, he likes for us to, well, when you lift your hands, you're surrendering. And when you say the word hallelujah, you're saying, I give it all. Here I am, Lord. Take me, Lord. Do whatever you want to do with me, Lord. Here I am, as the song goes. Uh, use me, Lord. You, some people pray that prayer and say it, but then when God tries to use them, it don't work out too good. But So we've got to be, we want to be, when we come to church, we don't come to be entertained. We don't come to listen to the musicians, but we come to entertain him. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. And when we get to worship in him, first of all, he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw others, all men unto me. So if we get to lifting Jesus up on Sunday morning around here, is something going to start drawing the community? We need to go down there and see what's going on. And unfortunately, even I come out of a background of a church where uh, we, I ain't even going to mention the denomination, it don't matter, but we just sat there. We didn't, we didn't clap. We didn't say amen. Matter of fact, my daddy told me to sit still, don't move, don't make a sound. Uh, if anybody did get loud or anything in there, the usher would escort them out the back door. And, uh, but that's not biblical. Okay, the Bible says there's a time, now there's a time and a place for everything. If we hooping and hollering while the word's trying to go forth, that's out of order. Now, yes, we can say amen and agree with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we become disorderly to a point to where we're interfering in the service and the word going forth. Now, I'm on, just to hit a couple of you here, but this is even where we need to work with our children because I don't want my child to be a stumbling block to someone else trying to get fed. You know what I mean? But it takes time training them. And God knows that, and he expects us to work on them at home and teach them that there, there's times when we sit still. There's times when we're quiet. There's times when we pray. There's times when we read the Word of God. And when they see us doing those things, then they'll follow suit in those. And that's what we need to be doing. We should every day at some point get our Bibles out, whether it be on your telephone. I've got my Bible here. I read it on there a lot. Some people listen to the audio Bible with their headphones on or just get the old Bible itself out and read. But you don't want to read to just be reading. You want to read in context. You know, if I pick up the book of Romans, you know, 
I want to know, well, first of all, this is Paul writing to the church in Rome, and he's telling them how to live and act right. So when you read it with that mindset, it starts making a whole lot more sense when they talk about certain things. Okay, salvation's usually not taught in any of those books. Them people's already saved. Matter of fact, like in Romans 6, it even mentions their salvation experience and conversion, their baptism. Um, so we want to learn the Word of God and get that thing in there to where the devil can't stumble us up with any kind of hatred or bitterness. So many people, I've found that uh, older people grow cold on the pew and They've been there so long and they've been bit so many times and they've done, they, they, they sit in the same chair every Sunday and they go through the same old prayer and it really don't touch. It's kind of like a marriage just went sour. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't, it's just it's a bad deal. You know what I mean? I want to keep my love life with Jesus going good. And, and if you're intimate with him, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve and they had Cain and Abel. Okay, so I want him to know me. And that means to know me intimately. And if he and I get together intimately, I can't help but bear his seed. And his seed is individuals that I bring to the Lord. Everybody you bring ain't going to take, all right? That's just a fact, all right? They say about every hundred people you go through, you'll be lucky if one sticks for any length of time. I have noticed in the 27 years of pastoring that people will stay from three to five years in this church, and then out the door they go. Joy, if we had all the people that has been here, there would be thousands. For a long time, I kept an access database with visitors, and we were running five, 600 visitors a year through here. And you just couldn't get them to stick. They just uh, going to church wasn't top priority on their list. Living for God wasn't top priority. You know, um, I, I had one couple tell me one time, they said, well, you know, we still like to go out on Saturday night and hold the red solo cup, you know, and dance a little bit and drink a little bit and look at my neighbor's wife, and, you know what I mean? And, 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 and they said, we like doing that, and we don't want to have to give that up. Oh, I'd hate to get down to 70, 80 years old and, my eyes grow dim and I check out of this world and realize that I traded eternity over little things like that. Uh, it's a cheap sale, I'm telling you. The devil's selling the world out there all day long. People's getting up and going to work wide open every day. They're not thinking about the Lord. They're burying their dead. They're still not thinking about the Lord. And I want you to be aware of what's your surroundings Okay, I want you to have that situational awareness, okay? To where you know where you're at, you know where you're going, you know where the Lord's at. Yes, we're not perfect, okay? If you're looking for a perfect church, uh, you know, I don't know where one would be, okay? All of us at some point, we fall short. Uh, we're human, and when a brother or sister falls short, remember that relationship, loving your brother? You don't tear them down. You help build them back up. The Bible says if a brother is overtaken with a fault, those that are spiritual are supposed to restore them with meekness. But usually that isn't the way it happens nowadays. Did you hear what Joe back there did last week? He got drunk and was running through the streets in Manning. I've heard all kind of junk stories in this little town of people, and most of it wasn't even true. It was just people embellishing stuff, and, of course, it made them look better when someone else was doing something worse. So I hope in just this little bit of time tonight, I have helped you in guarding your heart, setting some principles in your life, you know, you, you, need to, you need to be steady. 
You, you with me? In the, in the, in the, we've been married now 32 years. We've been going to church ever since. It's not a question on Sunday, are we going to church? Matter of fact, I like to involve myself in a way that I have to go. <laughs> if I don't, I'm liable to sit home. I'll be honest with y'all. Just be transparent here as I wind down. Um, I ate something last night, and it didn't agree with me. And at 5 o'clock this morning when Val posted something on social networking, I had never went to sleep. You ever do that, get in the bed, and you're thinking, okay, now let's go to sleep, and you're going, okay, and you cut the light off, and then the next thing you know, you grab your phone and look at it a little bit, and you get a little sleepy, and it, I did that at 1 o'clock, and then I did it at 2 o'clock, and then at 3 o'clock, and then at 4 o'clock, and at 5 o'clock, I was still laying there. So today, I felt terrible. Did I feel like coming to church tonight? No. Did I feel like getting up here tonight and doing this? No. But guess what? I had to. And I thank God for that had to. So if you want to teach a Sunday school class, get involved back there. That way you'll be here for Sunday school. Or you'll find every excuse in the book not to come. Listen, that class we put on over there, they hadn't been many people over the last few weeks. You know, I remember growing up, my mom and dad, they'd either go to Sunday school or preaching. I remember them having the discussion. You know, we're going to go to Sunday school, we're going to go to preaching, and one or the other. And if they went to Sunday school, they'd skate out between changing classes and jump in the car and leave. And then I always wondered about that, why they didn't stay for the whole thing, you know. But, uh, I mean, they, the teachers over there spend time getting that lesson together to edify you and teach you things. Just biblical knowledge about things God did in other people's lives in the scriptures back years ago that will apply to our lives. When we hit a trial, we can say, well, you know what? He did this for Joseph. He'll do it for us. He took care of Jacob. He'll take care of us. You know what? He took care of the children of Israel. He let water flow from a rock. He'll do it for us. Yes, he will. It's amazing, isn't it? So keep your focus. Surround yourself with Christian-like people. I've always said if you hang around the hog trough, you'll get slop on you. Okay? So if you're hanging around people that sipping beer and cuss a little bit and, and doing those things that the world does, that stuff will ultimately get back on you. And so you almost have to get a new set of friends almost um, or, or at least be choosy about who you keep company with. You know, I don't want to be sitting around the table with somebody that's using the, a four-letter word every other word. You know what I mean? I just don't want to be around that. Um, you know, if you want to talk that way and live that way, that's your business, but I'm not, we're not going to live that way. And, and, you know, we're striving to get to heaven. You know, we're not worried too much about this life. We're worried about getting over there, getting past the judgment. What needs to be our top priority here tonight is if, if he, he called me up, I heard a sermon one time entitled, A Man God Called a Fool. And it was when he, that's day, he called him up, and he wasn't ready to go. And the Lord called him a fool because he hadn't got his house in order. He was building bigger barns, and he was worried about this and worried about that on this side. And, you know, and when, when it all said and done at the end of the day, it's, we leave it all. We drop everything right where we're at, and out that we, we're gone. And that's my job is to keep all of us on track, include myself. You know what I mean? Run from bitterness. Run from hatred. When someone does you wrong, pray for them instantly. Start calling their name, and, and that thing will leave you. It's a spiritual thing. That thing will leave you automatically, and you'll feel better. And that person, a lot of times, will come back and apologize. I found it's like the spirit kind of moves on them and convicts them, and they get it settled. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about if you bring your gift to the altar and you got alt with your brother, leave it right there and go get things right with him, then come back. 
And so uh, we have to be careful about those things, you know. And so we want to make sure we love him with all of our hearts. We put him number one in our lives. Do y'all say the blessing over your food when y'all eat around your table? Now I'm going to ask you again, okay. Do you just put one of them fast blessings on it because you're ready to eat? Or do you genuinely say, thank you, Lord, for the food you have provided for us today? You know, think about it for a minute. We could be on the other end of this spectrum and have nothing to eat. You know, 100 years ago, they fought, 150 years ago, they fought right here in the streets of Manning. And, and people did without and struggled. And nowadays, people, uh, we don't eat. To, to, because we need to eat. We eat because we enjoy eating out of abundance. Uh, years, well, even in the 70s, everybody was skinny. You know what I mean? They, they, they ate well as it was time to eat, you know. They didn't eat like we do. We, 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 let's get together and go out and eat. That seems to be our go-to thing, doesn't it? But uh, have I helped anybody tonight? Just one of them little friendly reminders. You know what? I need to make sure I keep the Lord number one. Now, they got, they got the ladies' night Friday night, and they put a lot into this. So all you ladies, come on. Drop what you're doing and come on down here. I've got the ice machine filled up over there. Y'all going to have a good time. It's going to be fellowship, uh, friends, rubbing elbows. It ain't always about the Bible, Okay. It's about coming together and just having friends, you know what I mean? And just iron sharpeneth iron, the Bible says. You know, we can come together and say, you know what, I've been struggling with my prayer life. You're going to go, oh, I have too, you know. Maybe you could call me every day about 6 o'clock or something and remind me, you know, have you prayed today? You know what I mean? Be prayer partners, you know, and things like this. Work together, you know. So y'all stand up with me. Don't forget, we got our picnic coming up. What we'll do with that picnic is right after church is we give everybody time to change their clothes and we use a head for the ball field. We'll have the grill out there and we'll get the grill going and cooking, get out there and play some ball, sit around in the lounge chair. I'll bring my big fan that I've got that's four foot that blows a big old nice breeze so hopefully it won't be hot. And we can sit around and sip a Coke and laugh and have a good time, lay all our worries down and just laugh and, and, and have a good time of fellowship. And don't be in such a hurry to eat your sandwich and jump in the car and go home. Hang out a little bit. You know, I'm guilty of that sometimes. You know, once I get the business over with, let's go to the house, you know. But uh, spend, get to know one another. And uh, yeah, that's what the church is all about. It's about going through life together and strengthening one another and learning from one another. And You testify, and it builds me up because I'm going through what you just testified about, you know. So don't forget, Friday night, what's tomorrow night? What do we do on Thursday night? Thursday night, we come down here and we pray. Now, I had to give you all because gas was so high that you could pray at home. Have y'all been doing that for me? So just stop what you're doing about 6.30, go in the bedroom or the couch or wherever, and sit down and just have a little word of prayer. You know, if you'll stop for a minute and write down some things, you'll end up praying 30 minutes, praying over your kids, praying over your husband. Lord, have mercy, get... Brother Dexter home safe, you know? A lot of things could go wrong, and I know he's homesick. So y'all keep that brother in your prayers, okay? Keep their children in your prayers. We need to be praying for one another. I know I beat the dead horse to death here tonight, so we're going to pray. If you've got a need, I want you just to raise your hand. God, note this is a by faith we're raising our hand. Now, if you don't raise it, I guess you don't have none. Okay, everybody could use a few dollars. So let's pray together. Father, we love you. We're so thankful, Lord. We're so privileged to be able to stand here in the presence of the creator of the world, the one that spoke all of these things into existence. 
Father, you're the one that talked with Noah. You're the one that spoke with Moses and led the children of Israel out of Egypt, Lord. You're the one that hung on that cross and died for us, Lord. God, let us bring honor to you, Lord. Let us come Sunday morning, Lord, and present ourselves as living sacrifices, O oh God. Lord, you know our needs, Lord. You know our situations, Lord. You know our weaknesses, Lord. You know our vices that we have here tonight. Lord, we put all of those into your hands, and we ask you, Lord, to strengthen us, Lord, and help us, Lord. Give us wisdom, O oh God, from above. Lord, whatever you do, Father, don't let us be lost. God, preach the word to us, Lord. Correct us, O oh God, if we're off the beaten path, if we've gotten off the straight and the narrow way, Lord. O oh God, lead us and guide us and keep us, Lord, that we can pass the judgment one day and hear those words, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, Jesus, I love you with more than words could say here tonight. I pray, Lord, for our ladies gathering Friday night that you'll be in the middle of all of that, Lord. I pray, Lord, we could be a witness, Lord, this week, everywhere we go. We could bring somebody to church with us Sunday. And, Lord, we give you the honor and we give you the praise tonight that you so deserve. And we ask all of this in the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. amen. Clap your hands to him. Let's go on. I love all of you. Joy, tell Richard I love him.